Hello, and welcome to Investment and the Latest Innovations in Health Tech. I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KL Gates LLP, which is a fully integrated global law firm on five different continents with 48 different offices uh, and nearly 2,000 attorneys. We've got a fantastic panel here today with Mary Jo Potter, who is a partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures. Welcome back, Mary. We've got Gary Goldman, who's a managing director at Global Health Impact Fund. And we've got Mary Grove, who's also returning, who's a managing partner at Bread and Butter Ventures. And she's outside of the Bay Area, which is great, so we can get some uh, a different perspective. Now, I'm going to let each of the panelists tell you a little bit about themselves in a moment. Uh, but before I do, I'd like to go over a couple things and share some information about today's panel with you. So... First, uh, I'm running all the tech in the background. So if you see me look away or appear distracted, I'm probably answering or tending to something. I'm not ignoring the panelists. I think they're terrific. Um, second, today's panel is recorded. So if you miss some or all of it, so long as you have registered, you'll receive a copy within a week. Same thing too, if you are watching on a time-shifted basis, welcome. We're delighted to have you here. A corollary to the fact that it's recorded is this is not a venue for sharing confidential information, so please don't do that. The panel will discuss uh, a number of topics for about an hour, and then they will take questions. I will not be monitoring the chat, so if you've got questions for the panel uh, that you want to have answered in the last half hour, please use the Q&A function. Uh, I will be monitoring that, and we're going to be trying to answer questions of general applicability, that is questions that will apply to the most number of people in the room or who we think will be viewing this afterwards. Uh, additionally, we've got an audience survey. Let me just pull up the poll here. And we'd love for you to answer that. And we'll go over that in a minute, but we'd love to know who's in the room today, who's watching us live. All right, with that in mind, I'd like to take a moment to have each of the panelists introduce themselves, provide a little bit of background information about their firm, and also to the extent they want to share some contact information, provide that information. We'll start with you, Mary Jo. Okay. Uh, Mary Jo Potter, I uh, Managing Director of Healthcare Angels, which is a network of healthcare professionals that want to be focused on innovation and really provide subject matter expertise to a lot of the due diligence activities. Also a partner at Kuretsu Capital, and I'm on the investment committee there, heavily focused, uh, is uh, heavily focused in healthcare. And then uh, recently, the last year, Pegasus Tech Ventures, which is corporate venture capital as a service where they've got $2 billion under management, 45 uh, limited partners many of whom are Japanese companies who want access to our innovation here. So it's a diverse set of activities. Well, wonderful, Mary Jo. We're delighted to have you back. Uh, Gary, would you tell us a little bit about yourself and the Global Health Impact Fund? Happy to. Uh, you can hear me, right? Yep. Um, so Gary Goldman, uh, uh, I have 35 years uh, in healthcare in many different positions clinically as well as administratively. Um, started as a dentist, became a physician, got an MBA. Um, but uh, it all led to uh, about five years ago, I was consulting around the country uh, as uh, um, a large a large system uh, physician informaticist. And everywhere I went, I was running into clinicians that were disenfranchised and not happy with electronic healthcare records, a little bit unhappy with the direction in which digital health was moving because it really didn't include necessarily the input of the clinicians uh, that we were actually using the, uh, the, the solutions. So we started Global Health Impact Fund and Network, which is a clinician-driven, funded, managed uh, venture fund and global network and ecosystem to support uh, everything from idea, early idea generation, innovation through commercialization. So uh, we have a large global network of clinicians that have opportunities to be investors, advisors, consultants, and active participants as innovators and, and entrepreneurs. Fantastic. Welcome back, Gary. And Mary Grove, last but certainly not least. Thank you so much, Jason, for having me back. And hello to everyone. It's exciting to see such a global audience. And I, I always so love this event and this audience. So 
excited for today and to be with Mary Jo and, and Gary as well. So I'm Mary Grove, Managing Partner at Bread and Butter Ventures, coming to you live today from a very snowy Minneapolis, Minnesota. I'm a California native, so I was joking what, a, what an adjustment this has been, but it's been a phenomenal opportunity to build um, a, a fund really focusing on healthcare from the Midwest, from Minnesota specifically, and, and we'll talk more about that. But Bread and Butter Ventures, we're a seed stage venture firm investing all across the country. We can make international investments as well. And we really focus on what we call the bread and butter sectors, if you will, of the modern economy. So we go super deep in three vertical areas, digital health, enterprise SaaS, and food tech. And those are our three main areas. We seed stage invest, which means those are typically rounds in the two to $3 million range. Mm -hmm. Our average initial investment is half a million dollars. We are investing out of our third fund. I have 61 companies in the portfolio. And our, our secret sauce, if you will, is leveraging what we call this Minnesota home field advantage of accessing the Fortune 500 and large corporate backbone that exists in our state. And so Minnesota is home to the highest number of Fortune 500 companies per capita in the nation. It is also home to more than a thousand healthcare businesses headquartered here, including you know, the number one ranked hospital system in the, in the country, Mayo Clinic, the number one uh, largest private insurer, United Healthcare. We have Blue Cross Blue Shield, Minnesota. Mm -hmm. We have um, Alina, Medtronic, just a real bastion of leadership within healthcare. And so our firm plugs into those ecosystem partners in a variety of ways to support companies after we invest. And then just my personal background here at Bread and Butter, I lead our healthcare practice as well as a lot of our enterprise SaaS work. And before this, I was an investment partner at Revolution on the rise of the REST seed fund, focusing on uh, digital health, enterprise SaaS, future of work, and fintech. And before that, I was at Google for 15 amazing years, including you know almost two decades out there uh, in Silicon Valley. And so I, my perspective is really um, sort of a, a tech product early stage and grateful to be here today. We are delighted to have you back as we are delighted to have all the panelists returning today. It's going to be a fantastic discussion. I'd like to kick off. Here we are in February, almost March of 2023. Uh, and there has been a, a lot of, I think, you know, uh, evolution or change, I think, in the venture capital market, and especially within the health tech sector or, or vertical within the last 24 to 36 months or so. It'd be wonderful if we could have the panelists maybe share a little bit about what, you know, first, maybe what we're talking about when we're talking about health tech, which, you know, I understand to include digital health. A potentially med tech, maybe even a little bit of crossover into some health and wellness, although sometimes we stay, stay away from that. Um, but what else are we going to be talking about today when we're talking about health tech? Maybe we'll start right there. And um, I'll kick it back to, to Mary Grove, uh, who went last and can now go first. And it's really how do we define health tech and what have we been seeing in, in the past few quarters, Jason? Great. Correct. Yep, that's right. Great. So today's topic of conversation, I, I certainly I would say is, is broad and all encompassing across the various those, those sectors of healthcare, from digital software to we can talk about devices, you know, pharmaceutical, a range of things. I will note that my my own perspective is very software driven. So I invest specifically in the digital side, software and, and tech enabled hardware. And so definitely have that perspective. But I think a conversation around the industry would be uh, terrific. And in terms of what we're seeing. Right, looking back from 2020 until now, it's just been such a roller coaster of uh, activity, ups and downs. And I think we saw such a amazing surge of dollars flowing into digital health and exciting areas within that, and and so many things to explore today, ranging from you know women's health to more investments in AI and data and infrastructure to social determinants of health and and the whole nine yards. We've seen within our portfolio and the companies that. Uh, the hundreds that we've seen come through the pipeline, I'll say that the macroeconomic environment is definitely uh, sobering. However, great companies are born in every environment and all environments. And we are just buried right now under a barrage of super interesting quality deal flow within healthcare. And so good news is great companies are starting and great companies are still getting funded, though we are seeing, of course, that valuations are taking a haircut, round sizes are smaller, and it's taking a bit longer to close. And this is for companies, certainly at the growth and later stage, but we're seeing the pressure all the way down to the seed stage where we invest now. And so I am very hopeful that there, there is plenty of dry powder and capital to be deployed. 
and there are plenty of great companies. It's a matter of continuing to mobilize. And, you know, if we look at historical data from the last two recession cycles, the Great Recession and the 2000, the 2000 era, we know that those fund vintages, for example, performed extremely well. It's a great time to be investing. And so I'm excited and hopeful about the year. We've continued our normal pacing as usual and are um, sitting at the the one yard line of a bunch of new investments this this quarter as well. So I feel overall optimistic, but uh, but realistic too. Mm-hmm. Fantastic, Mary. It looks like Mary Jo, maybe you have something to add as you're shaking your head. Well, I'm agreeing with everything Mary's saying, uh, but I uh, to, to sort of add a few other elements. Uh, I just saw an article this morning that the number of unicorns and hundred million dollar investments are, you know, really down significantly. Uh, so I think what we'll see in the next six months, twelve months, just reflecting on the momentum of the of the current time, uh, M and A slowed down, IPOs have slowed down, the exit side has slowed. So it's causing some of our later stage companies to need additional monies that maybe they hadn't thought of. So that's a bit of a drain on the seed stage. Uh, not, it's not gonna stop it, it will just slow it down. Uh, the second thing that's happening is the buyers, if you will, mainly the health systems and uh, all the delivery system itself had a terrible 22. So they're coming out of a financial uh, pain <laughs> that's slowing them down from putting in new things and investing and so on and so forth. A lot of the corporate venture folks in healthcare have either, again, not necessarily added to their funds uh, or again, they're, they're just slowing down. So there, there's a, a bit of that dynamic. Having said that, I'm with Mary. Um, the good companies get through. They you just got to keep going. I, half the time I just say to people, just keep going, just keep going. <laughs> and I do think by this time next year, I, I'm, I'm very optimistic, quite frankly, after we just get through this hiatus, because I think we needed a bit of a correction, but people have got to survive. So we're going to see uh, some of the mid-stage companies needing money that didn't think they would. So those are just additional insights. Jason, you want yeah, me to go. jump in? Yeah, yeah, yeah go oh, for yeah, it. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I agree with both Marys, Mary squared um, um, on everything that was said, but I'll take it, you know, Jason, you know, I always take a bit of a different focus because of the clin- clinical background um, and and the, the approach that our fund takes. So, you know, I mean, just digital health in itself, if you know, you cast a wide net of digital health, it's very, very broad, um, especially if you include like digital therapeutics. Um, and it's been a bit of a roller coaster ride, actually, over the last five years, because, you know, first we were in, a, in, in, in an economically positive climate and the world was our oyster. But on the adoption side, it was very hard to get my colleagues, including myself, to really adopt digital technology, right? Because we were doing fine. It's very, you know, things change very slowly in healthcare. So um, to get the clinicians especially and the hospitals to make changes by leveraging technology was difficult. But then all of a sudden, and I, you know, I don't like to say this publicly, but it's reality, the God gave us a present that was called a pandemic because mm-hmm. the pandemic, as horrible it is from a clinical perspective, was probably one of the best things that happened to digital health and digital health investment because it took a spotlight and, and shine, shown it on the global delivery of care and how inadequate and how many gaps there were when we were forced out of the office and the clinic and the ambulatory setting and had to still deliver care to sick people. So it, it, it made technology a necessity. I, I mean, I just have so many memories of companies that were struggling that all of a sudden had so much opportunity that they couldn't even keep up anymore once the pandemic happened. And we've gone through three years of pandemic. And then of course, you know, what's the old line is, you know, man make plan or, you know, person make plan and God laughs. You know, he, then he turns around and, you know, or whatever that entity is turns around and says, okay, let's, let's destroy the macroeconomic climate to just kind of temper this a bit. 
And it really has, on the other side of the equation, slowed down fundraising, slowed down valuations. We've heard it's really taken an impact on innovation and tech and and uh, acceleration and exit of companies because the money isn't just just isn't there. So we're at a very interesting time right now. But I share the enthusiasm of my colleagues. We are not short of deal flow and we are not short of great companies. But the last thing that I will end in is if I have learned anything over the last five years of running this fund, you know, there's remote patient monitoring and there are platforms and there are, and there's all these great great solutions out there, but I am convinced that the future of healthcare is data, okay? And what we do with that data and how we collect that data. And from a clinician's perspective, that is where the future of, I believe that a lot of this investment is gonna go. For the companies that are not necessarily collecting data, but coming up with machine learning platforms and AI platforms that allow us to take the data and assist clinicians and patients and their ability to take care moving forward, take care of themselves moving forward is really the future. And that's the focus that we're really looking at for more. Nope, thank you all. I, so I would like to, so the macroeconomic environment has come up a few times and I'd love to probe a little bit deeper on that because uh, we already touched on maybe some of the specific things. But before I do, I would like to just take a moment to um, provide you some information on the survey results, because I think it's helpful to know who's in the room today. And, you know, if you're not watching us live, you're watching recording, we're also delighted to have you uh, view that. But we've got a strong contingent from the Bay Area, uh, which is about 25%. Elsewhere in California, 12%. And then elsewhere in the US, 40%. So we've got a lot of folks from the US and North America here, as, as one would probably expect for the time zone purposes, you know, it's sort of easier to view us from North America, if you will. 10% uh, from Europe. So thank you for staying up late. Uh, and then uh, amazingly, as I'm always shocked, there's some folks in Asia and Australia. Uh, and, you know, thank you for staying up really, really late. And many times they get to catch this on the recording. So thanks for watching the recording. Uh, we've got, I'm going to share these results. I think it should go to everybody. Um, We've actually got equal parts first-time entrepreneur and serial entrepreneur, which I'm always glad to see. Um, and then, and that's at roughly 22, 23%. And then a third are from early stage companies, which is sort of not a surprise. So great to have you all here today. Let's get back to, to talk about some of these macroeconomic uh, factors that are influencing the market, if we can. Um, and maybe we can at least name and label and identify some of them. I think... Uh, on the provider side, Mary Jo had indicated that you know health healthcare systems and other folks who are typically the the purchasers they've had tough, um, you know tough twenty two a tough uh, two thousand and twenty two, and then you know what are some of the other factors? I mean, we often see bandied about, and this also came up too, is the capital markets right and sort of the progression towards exit and and liquidity, which would among other things uh, enable funds and angels to reseed the, this particular vertical. Can we talk a little bit about what some of those are? Mary Grove, um, I think you brought up the subject maybe first because you went first before. Maybe you could share a little bit with, you know, with the audience. Sure. So in terms of the, the broader macroeconomic environment, you know, we've gone back and looked at, uh, I, I cited earlier, kind of how did the previous, how did funds, venture funds and investing perform back during the last two recession cycles? And I have the, the data here in terms of the the IRR of fund vintages from the last two recession cycles. If you look at the three years prior to the recession, so 98, 99, 2000, for example, those the IRR of those fund vintages were 9%, 8.48%, and 11.29%. And then if you start you know, enter, entering the market during the, these recessionary periods, 2001, 2002, and 2003, returns were 17.5%, 15.9%, and 14.9%. So we see a a market difference in it actually was a great time to invest because we're trying to sort of bring everyone along into the you know we're afraid we're sitting on the sidelines but but actually it's it's a phenomenal time same pattern in in the 2009 great recession right if you look at the data from 2005 2006 2007 irr fund vintages in those years 7.6 percent 8.2 percent 11.8 percent and then if we look at that 08 09 to 2010 returns were 14.5, 16.3, and 18.1, right? And so 
I'd like to just say that's going to happen all over again. But the, the difference that we see in this current market is actually inflation, right? And the role that inflation did not play during those last two cycles. And so we don't know. The cost of capital is very expensive right now is the, is the short answer. And we are seeing that pressure in companies that we're working with, for example, who are IPO ready, right? Just have waited already 18, 24 months and will wait another however long, right? Because that's it's not the, the best time for that. Similarly, companies who need growth capital who might be close to profitability or be able to get there, preserve that ability to not have to take in more capital at this stage in this valuation. So it is very uh, tricky in that regard. For, for us, we're very active seed investors. Most of our portfolio is still quite young. Um, some series C, some B, but largely seed moving to A or some series A funded companies just to give you a, a sense of who's in there. And universally at the early stage across the board, we're, we're working with our companies this year. Your goal is to survive and get through 2023. If you can't raise in one single additional dollar, what's our plan for that? And this was planning that we did in Q4 of last year, right? And th that's the, the rainy day scenario. Hopefully, you know, you close some more contracts or we are able to reduce burn significantly to make it through that, but this is not the time to, you know, sweat the details on. The goal is survival to thrive and know that the narrative arc of fundraising for a company is long. And so we have, you know, valuations have definitely come down, but that doesn't mean it'll be depressed forever. And so I, just to give you some data points, you know, I, what used to be an easier 15 to $20 million series A is now in that 10 to $12 million range, still, ca still happening, right? And maybe that's a an eight to ten million, twelve million dollar round at a thirty, forty million dollar post money valuation versus what we used to see of like, what's the revenue multiple on that, and and so, ultimately not a bad thing built to last companies. We have to make it through. We can get creative about the strategies, but Jason, I do think that we are in a little bit of a different climate. That said, plenty of funds raised new capital in the last two to three years. As fund managers, we are responsible for returning capital in a general, you know, seven to 10 ish year time frame, plus or minus. And so to return capital, you need to deploy it first. And so there is also that, uh, that factor on the table. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. That's, that's very helpful. Mary Jo or Gary, do you have anything to add? Otherwise I have some follow-up questions, but I want to make sure you guys get a crack at, at it first. Mary Jo, do you have, have anything you want to go? Just a, a quick thought on the exit side. Um, Again, I think the multiples on exit are coming down. So quite frankly, I think you're much more realistic, uh, number one. Number two, the, uh, I actually think healthcare is entering into the next phase of life with a lot more acquirers than we've had. You know, it used to be every presentation I saw in the med tech world had five or six companies that were all going to buy everybody. And, and I kept saying to them, well, that's not going to happen. They, on average, they buy eight or 10 companies a year. Do you think you're one of the, the, the likely ones? Now, again, things like the Amazon One Medical, and there's lots of those examples. I, I think, again, if people can just hang tight, the options are getting better. They're getting broader. You've got people getting into healthcare from other industries. We see internationally. Uh, as much as we have our problems here in healthcare, companies all over the world want the technologies that we have. You know, it's it's U.S., Israel, Turkey, and Ireland are you know substantive places for getting good health health tech kinds of things. So um, that's the optimistic side if we can just weather the storm. Yeah, I mean, Mary, I would I would agree on on that side of it as well because. That's the other thing about digital health, right? You know, pre-digital health investments in healthcare um, were more fixed on devices, pharmaceuticals, things like that, right? But they tended to be somewhat global, but mostly direct, uh, addressed at our domestic market, where from, from the start, digital health is a globally deployable solution, easily deployable, actually. Um, and in many places, as I said before, because of the pandemic, there's a real need for it because they don't have the access, right? So, so for me, the total addressable market from every aspect of it, from the money, is much, much greater whether we're in a macroeconomic environment or not. There are still 
going to be a need for a lot of this. So um, I'm actually more optimistic because the world is our oyster in terms of all of that. And it changes things because now we, you know, I mean, actually raising capital, deploying capital, managing investments that's global is a much bigger um, uh, workflow or hard, more difficult workflow for a company than just domestic, you know? Um, and then the hurdles of course change as well. So, so for me, that's a very important part of it. But I, what I wanna focus a little bit about is on the pre. Okay, raising the capital. It's been very interesting from our perspective because we're an unusual venture fund in that we raise most of our fund money from individual clinicians, right? So we're more like an SPV um, and it's, it's a lot more work to raise the capital. Now we just started our first institutional fund and that's a different uh, example, of course, or a different workflow. But for us, because of the, the, the economic environment, it's, we look very carefully at the risk stratification of our investors, right? Because if we're doing an SPV and you're investing in an individual company, which we do do, that has disappeared completely for us. We can't raise a penny from an SPV because most of our investors are not willing to take that risk profile given where the rest of their, their investments are. So many of them are more apt to invest in a fund because it's more risk stratified and diversified an investment vehicle, but that has also slowed down quite a bit for us. Um, so it's made it difficult to raise the capital because we started with one fund and now we have three new funds. Um, on the institutional side, I personally, we're experienced, I've been to Abu Dhabi and I've been to Dubai and I've been to New York and there's just not a lot of money being thrown at good ideas, um, at investment ideas right now. So it really has slowed things down. So. Although optimistic, it's taking a lot longer to get to that point, as Mary uh, Grove said earlier, is that you know the sales cycle and the investment cycle, which is our job from a fiduciary standpoint, is taking much longer because you got to have the money to make the investments, and we're taking more time to make the investments because there are so many opportunities and not a lot of players out there right now. So, and I would just add one note to that is is that just from a, how, how our own investing behavior has changed. I mentioned we've remained active through the, through the sort of popping up and the slowing, the cooling down within digital health. We've remained our same pacing, which is about one new investment per month, so about a, a dozen a year. But what has changed is the risk profile and, and tolerance around those. And so we're, we're really comfortable going quite early and under, underwriting a lot of risk. Whereas we used to do a lot of you know smaller one and a half million dollar rounds, like get it up and running and then let's go out and raise again. We have not participated in a digital health investment that is smaller than $3 million at the seed stage in the last 18 months. And that's because we do not want to be back out raising, that company to be back out raising mm -hmm. in under a year, right? So we have to have, we have, we have complex risky go-to-markets and we know it takes time to execute on them. And so we want to have at least ideally two years of right, 18 months at a minimum, but ideally two years to really prove that out before we have to come back to market again. And so that's the calculation. It's not that we're not investing. I have this great company I'm looking at now who wants to raise a million. So they're like, well, you know, if we come on board, could we help you get that to, to two, two and a half? Because that would give you enough time to really, it's going to be harder to raise, right? Right. No, I, I love that you brought that up because that was sort of my follow-up question, which is like the earlier you brought up surviving, get through 2023, right? But like, what, what does that look like in concrete terms to, you know, to companies in your portfolio or those that are raising? Is that like, think about the next raise will be in 36 months instead of 24 months? Like what, how, how is that? Uh, sounds like Mary was able to share some of, some of the feedback that she's giving to either her portfolio companies or those of which she might invest. Uh, Gary and Mary Jo, what, how, how has your advice changed, if at all? I mean, I think, oh, Mary, if you want to start, go ahead. No, no, you go. I oh, know. I was going to say, apropos to that, you know, we also, you know, you had brought it up earlier, Jason, is that our existing investments, right? So we've gotten first fund one, we've got 11 investments, and it's been really interesting. And Again, since we, you know, we haven't been doing this that long for about five years, the pandemic had its own effects on 
company's ability to get to commercialization, especially if they were clinical companies, because you couldn't do the clinical studies, right? Because uh, because of the pandemic, so that slowed things down. So a number of our companies wound up having to raise a bridge because you know what they thought was going to be twelve to fourteen months for the clinical study, all of a sudden became two and a half, three years in in some cases, not most, but but in some. Um, and then with the economic environment the way it is right now. Um, we found that if you layer on, we, we're kind of moving out of that problem with getting clinical studies done now, but a lot of our companies um, are still experience a little bit more lengthy sales cycle with, as you mentioned, the hospitals, because they're not making the investments unless there's a clear return on investment, because they don't have a lot of liquid cash to take, you know, take new technology. So, um, we're experiencing, again, companies coming back to us, especially if we were the lead and saying, you know what, we probably need another million or two. So I would completely agree with what Mary Grove said, is that in a way, it's much safer to come in with more money early on and, and work with the company, which I think we all do very closely, to get them to the next milestone in a shorter period of time because they have the capital to do it. Because it's not that easy to go back out and do a bridge right now. So. Um, that does, uh, I, I would agree with that. The other thing that we're encouraging, and they, they, a lot of these companies should do this anyway, but if you don't have to right away, people tend to go to strategics a bit later when they can you know, really demonstrate what they've got. But we're encouraging them to have the strategic relationship sooner for two reasons. One is it benefits the strategic because they get involved and can add lots of value in addition to money. Secondly, they are much more open, I would say, to things like a bridge or an interim because they're part of it, they see it, and they understand the problem. Uh, and number three, we, we always say to our companies, as soon as you have other people's money, your main customer is that person who gave you the money. And then you've got your direct customer and then you've got et cetera. And having strategics close by, even if they don't end up being the acquirer, they educate uh, the companies much better than other ways to what, it, what is the value of this? What, why would somebody eventually buy this? Having to think that through earlier, I think is very beneficial. So some of that, while it, we say it's triggered because of the, economic situation, I think we probably should have done more of it anyway. <laughs> Jason, I had one other thing that just came, if you don't mind. Uh, um, sure. So when it comes to those companies, and we've experienced this with several of our companies, again, because of what I mentioned earlier about the, the global aspect of digital health, you know, if you look at at the end of the day, I'll agree that your investor is your number one customer, but at the end of the day, you, the number one drive has to be revenue, right? So, um, and if you're dealing with EU and you're dealing with the, the, the Here, I think we met, I don't know if this is my internet connection or, or if it's Gary's, can everyone else hear me okay? Do you guys hear me? Is it me? Yeah, is this any better? Going in and out. Yeah, you froze for a second there. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing one, two, three, four. Right. We know we know you can count now, Gary. We're good. <laughs> okay, good, 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 good. Um, yeah. I'm Every sorry. investor needs to be able to count. Just just saying. <laughs> the bar is very high. <laughs> you, <would hope. laughs> you guys are bad. So, um, but what I was going to say is from a commercialization perspective, we have actually spent a lot of time helping our companies commercialize in markets that they would not have originally gone to. And I think that's a very important point in terms of the growth of the company to get towards exit. I just want to add a couple of quick thoughts, Jason, and some more tactical things too. I noticed Please, a lot yeah, of- Yeah, that's fantastic. Absolutely. Great. A lot of, I know a lot of our attendees are entrepreneurs or at, at startups um, at the moment. And so just a few tactical things, and this builds on something that Mary Jo pointed out, which is I'm absolutely obsessed with you know the great communication between investors and founders, but it's all the more important in this environment. And we recommend, for example, that every company send a monthly written investor update to their investors that tracks the same consistent KPIs month over month. That should be table stakes. And it is shockingly rarer than you might imagine. 
and just this this notion that nothing should be a surprise the flow and transparency in both directions is is happening at all times it's even more important in this market because you are likely to need more capital right and you're likely to we don't want to just hear from companies when they need money if we if they go silent on us we assume something's wrong and so i would just encourage that transparency of communication at all times but in particular in these types of markets we've also for companies who successfully raised new rounds last year off a hot market to to examine the possibility to reopen that round to take more capital in either a flat round extend the round maybe a tiny bump if, if we're lucky but just take the long view of right now we're raising off the back of momentum is there an opportunity so that's a strategy that we've been actively working with a number of companies on um, focusing as well on the capital efficiency of a dollar right now is paramount it's it used to be you know but we're fueling growth 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 at all costs and now it's sort of what what are we able to generate with a dollar uh, from an output perspective and then to that end, just an absolute laser focus on to, to the company on honing in on that value prop. What is the return on investment for all? Play, what's the ROI for you know the patient, for the provider, for the payer, whomever you're working with, and just nailing that out the gate. We have less time to prove that out now. So those are a few quick thoughts in terms of how we've been working uh, with our companies, but it's um. It seems to be working. I think I think the strategic is a great lens. And I think going to individual investors too have, have moved very quickly, much more quickly, I would say, in some of these um, bridge or interim rounds. Mary, can I ask you uh, just a question on that? So I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, uh, um, I subscribed to Medium and I get a bunch of content. It looks like Brett Brohl wrote uh, an article on how to provide a great investor update. Was that is that sort of the advice you're referring to? I mean, would that count? I'd be happy to put the link in the chat if- Sure, absolutely. Here. Yes, we, yeah. and we, when we make an investment, we actually require, we, we set expectations out the gate and it's one of our, our requirements or asks is this, and we also do monthly one-on-ones and regular you know, time in, in day-to-day as well. But this is a quick, we wrote this template just based on, we see hundreds of templates that we liked this as an example of a format. Very, very easy to do and consistent. And then I get questions a lot too of should what if I should use Docsend or Notion or something that's retractable? And my, my point is if you can't trust your investors to email them information, you probably shouldn't take their capital. So mm-hmm. using a software platform is totally fine, but not if you're only because you're worried about um, them having it in email format. And so, but this is my number one and it's beginning, beginning of the year now. And so I've been, we've been really, really working hard to, if this isn't happening, understand why and, and get it going again that importance of, of great communication. So, um, we've got about 20 minutes left. Uh, we've talked a lot about, I think, survival and how to extend, you know, extend your range, if you will. Um, I'd love to, it, you know, earlier in the conversation, Mary Jo mentioned, maybe there'll be, you know, she sort of hopefully optimistically sees a shift maybe in six to 12 months. I'd love to spend some time talking about reasons why, why we'd you know hope and expect to maybe see that shift you know whether that's dry powder which I think Mary and maybe Gary also you know raised earlier there's a lot of dry powder out there but maybe we could start with that about unpacking you know when there might be a little bit of a thaw or there might be some more favorable or company favorable investor uh, conditions Mary Joe sure uh, one of the things that's going to drive it is in fact the health systems are feeling tremendous pressure operationally for margin, but more importantly, they're recognizing in 10 years, if they haven't done something pretty major, they're out of business. It's like the steel industry. We're gonna look at hospitals 10 years from now. They're gonna be significantly smaller. They're gonna be significantly focused on the very, very, very serious problems. Everything else is moving out. We're gonna have the home, being the center of the universe for a significant amount of healthcare. And none of that is doable yet. I mean, it, so the, the pressure is on and the consumer is so spoiled in every other industry that the consumers are not willing either to uh, watch people fax things back and forth. I mean, it's, it's comical. So I do think the natural pressures of the market the market dynamic of the uh, all of the m a work that's had has happened and will be happening in the space all of these new players are nipping around the edges that's getting people's attention so while they feel the pain of um, 
the margin. And quite frankly, I don't know if people know this, the majority of health systems margin, I've been on, spent 25 years on Dignity, CHI, Christus's board. People don't realize, I'd rather be in the retail business. They make about one to 2% a year if it weren't for their income, their basic, the, the equity side of their life they'd be in significant trouble. So you can imagine you add the 22 year in the equity markets and this one doesn't look in all that great either. If they can't rely on that, they've got to hustle fast to figure out what's, what's gonna balance it. So I think all those pressures while painful are, are healthy for innovation. Uh, and any other reasons to be um, optimistic? I mean, at, at one point, Mary, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Gary. Oh, I just didn't know if you could hear me. Um, so yeah, I'll, I, I would agree with Mary, but I'll take a different approach to what do um, on our end because we are clinician driven. I think at the end of the day, one of the things that I've certainly come to conclude is if you're when you're a venture, because that. So you're, yeah, in you're, a way, yeah, you're breaking like, up. They slice gambling. I'll take my headphones off. Let me let me try that and see if that changes things. Real, or, or you could maybe try just going uh, audio. If that doesn't work. We could try audio only, at least for a little bit. Yeah. Is it better now? Testing so one. So far. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah, I took my headphones off, and I think that's the problem. Okay. Um, so what I was going to say is, you know, in it, so in 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 the with the concept of being able to predict the future, I think healthcare, and that's one of the reasons that certainly I went into this. It's essential that you have adequate access from the clinicians and the patients' perspective about where healthcare is going. And it's changing like an earthquake. The ground is shifting underneath us. And the pandemic forced a lot of it. But if you look at the future in terms of where what we look at to invest in and where delivery is going, delivery is being pushed out of hospitals. OK, and in ways as an anesthesiologist, I mean, they're now talking about being able to create technology where you're not replacing the clinician, but the the machine learning technology is actually doing most of the work with the clinician in the background. OK, so if you look at chronic care, if you look at critical care, you look at acute care, a lot of that care is being pushed to the point mm -hmm. of care and technology will allow our ability to deliver it at the point of care, even if it involves an extender at the point of care. So if you look at that delivery system, I think a lot of hospitals and, and overall, we're not paying enough attention to that because we're gonna find ourselves with a significant shift in where the point of care is being delivered. And that's where digital health really plays a huge role. And I, I believe that that is what will predict those market disruptive technologies that are being developed right now. And our fund is looking at a lot of that from a clinical perspective. What can be done? What are clinicians comfortable doing? And what are they comfortable in developing to still maintain the quality of care at the point of care? I would just add in terms of, you know, what reasons for optimism or why we can expect to come out hopefully sooner than later. One is just the, the enormous tailwinds that we saw you know, from the pandemic, this raising to the surface, how vulnerable our healthcare systems are end to end. That has driven a lot of activity from more generalist funds who maybe were dabbling a little bit or not really focusing on healthcare, health tech, digital health, to really add that as an emphasis area, as a pool of capital. That's a tremendous pool of capital right there is one reason to be optimistic. Two is that you know in these markets where we're forcing capital efficiency, a lot of companies are just racing to build in different ways and getting to break even or getting to profitability sooner, building these pretty pretty interesting built to last capital efficient companies. And I think in a few years that puts us in a place where consolidation will start to happen. We'll start to see some M and A within the category, which is you know related to point number three of when I and I think everyone saw the um, the Oak Street the CVS health news right and just wow, the, the amount of the jolt of energy of like a great a great big uh, exit in the industry, right? That is going to start to produce more and more of that flywheel of, okay, it, it's it's happening, whether it's smaller exits earlier or, you know, $10 billion ones, but it will it will continue to happen. And I think we just continue to build and invest and know that we've been riding a 
cycle for a while now, and there's sort of the other side of that. How about Mary Jo? Um, similarly, what are you seeing on the sort of so Pegasus Tech Ventures, right, is a uh, venture capital as a service fund. And so you have a lot of strategics and other corporates that, you know, you're involved with. I mean, what have you seen in their their activity level, especially as it relates to more early stage companies? I mean, one thing that I've seen, and I think the data has borne it out, is they continue to be ever more active, especially coming into those earlier stage companies. Um, you know, they 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 actually sort of swing a big bat in late stage, uh, but, and they sort of traditionally played more in the late stage, but they seem to be coming uh, into the companies earlier and earlier. What what have you what have you seen in the last several months and what do you see kind of shaking out in the next few? Well, and I'll, I'll speak briefly on the Pegasus opportunity, but more importantly, the CVCs in healthcare. And on the Pegasus side, about 25% of our LPs are willing to go below A. Um, so it's more than used to, but it's not huge. Where it's much more active than we would have thought is on the CVC side in healthcare itself. Uh, they they never used to touch anything below A. It's, and CVC I, is corporate venture capital. Just for those folks who are not familiar with their acronyms. Thank yep. you. I'm sorry. Yeah. No. No. It's it's okay. Um, anyway, they they would always. In fact, they really preferred B and C because they wanted to de-risk. They want to be able to go into, you know, a lot of these are only five to 10 years old. They're trying to prove themselves in a reasonable time frame. You go into seed and you're talking seven to 10 years. I mean, that's just, that's a, that's a fairly good cycle. So now that they've proven themselves more, they're moving down the value, or you could say up for two reasons. One is they really do want to shape the offering. One of the problems we have in health care innovation. So many people have a one-off. I've got a perfect solution to this piece of the puzzle. And the strategics are saying, I can't take a piece. I want the whole solution. I want it built into my workflow. I want you to adapt it so it fits into the workflow. They want solutions. They don't want products. So they want to get involved. And, and now what I see happening, these strategics are saying to three or four of their companies, you guys get together and make a full solution. So I think it's, again, I think it's going to be helpful. We'll get more into the system if we can, in fact, either integrate the product and service offerings better or incorporate them genuinely into the workflow better so that we can't expect the customers to do all that. So that's the other reason why I think we're seeing a lot of players get involved earlier. Yeah, I, I would say that with respect to that, that's one of the focuses of our network, not our fund, right? Is that when we make investments on our in our funds now, they have to be synergistic. They're not um, just independent investments. So spend like with fund one, we have one, you know, we'll, we'll look at a company that's in the women's health, labor and delivery space and then sleep medicine space, but the technologies are very conducive to working together because you're right. It's it's an unbundled approach that we've taken with digital health, similar to what we've done with electronic healthcare records. We're almost trying trying to make the same mistake twice. Is that um, you know it's very complicated for health systems and patients to have 27 different apps for different medical maladies that they have and manage their. There is to there has to be some forced. Um, merger slash strategic relationships um, that these companies have to take as an approach to be under a certain umbrella. And we're trying to approach that from a network perspective. And on the other side of it, we're working with the healthcare systems that are looking at these technologies. So, so for us, I'll, we can walk in the door now and say, okay, well, this first company, you're using our solution they exited. Well, by the way, we have three more investments that are synergistic with that investment that could be deployed under the same platform. Would you be interested? And the answer is pretty much always yes. So uh, that really, I believe, is the, is, the, is the future for these companies to be successful from a commercialization perspective. Otherwise, it's going to become it's so cumbersome, it's going to be difficult to manage. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, Mary, did you have any, anything to add? 
No. Um, so I guess we earlier you mentioned the cost of capital as sort of being one of the driving factors, and exactly. I wanted to maybe return to that and unpack it. Um, which, I mean, when I when I frequently hear that being referred to, it's sort of the measuring stick is like the interest rates, um, you know, as being one of the the ways to determine the cost of capital. Is that, you know, is that accurate? And you know, in terms of what the Fed is doing and the general market conditions, like what what do we see? sort of shaking out uh, in the next six months? I mean, should people be trying to read the tea leaves in terms of what the Fed meeting, you know, the reserve meeting minutes are every, you know, every what, quarter or whatever they are at this point? No, I mean, I think it's just that we, we as investors advise our companies to be as prudent and as proactive and long-term thinking as possible when it comes to their capital reserves and plans to raise capital or raise more capital now. And that is to say things like, you know, venture debt, raising venture debt or getting lines of credit are fewer and farther between, harder to come by these days, especially for companies that are pure software without uh, assets to lend against, for example. So that's one. And the other is that these larger funds, later stage funds who have, you know, large portfolios are sitting on a lot of that capital to put into the companies down the road when valuations come up a bit. So that's an interesting strategy that I recently was scratching my head a bit was sort of our company needs more capital, but we don't want to take a down round. So we're going to hang on to it and reserve that to put it in later. But then we're not making as many new investments because we're saving that capital. Capital isn't then being returned. And so I think it's all, you know, it's just to be prudent of. And so if you're, for example, if, if we have situations now where companies are feeling very valuation sensitive, maybe that it's their first time raising capital, you know, nobody wants to get a ton of dilution early, but if it's the opportunity to raise, let's say, I just want to raise a million for that reason, but I have interest in 2 million. My advice is let's figure out a valuation that feels respectful, but let's go for the two, right? And let's figure out how we can, We do, again, we don't want to be back fundraising sooner. And, and the metrics are the goalposts for what it means to be series A ready, are moving later and later, what it means to be a seed investor. We have angel investors now who are looking at diligence and they're asking the same questions we're asking as seed investors, right? And so I think it's just to be just to be prudent and think about take a long-term view when you're when you're thinking about fundraising. You know, there's another source of funds that we're just really beginning to tap and get to know. And they're the family offices. Mm -hmm. uh, they there's a fair interest now because many of them are trying to engage their next generation in social issues. And there's a great interest in that next group in healthcare, number one. Number two, many of the reasons people are wealthy is because they were able to work longer uh, and be active and they're living longer and they appreciate that. And then they get their knees and hips and whatever done. And then they want to give back so others can have this. So uh, I think uh, our entrepreneurs may want to also get to know some of the family offices in their geography. Just let them know what you're doing. Um, a lot of the universities have the relationships and interests in the, in the healthcare space uh, as well. And again, they're, they're, they're sort of all tied together. You go to a, I went to Northwestern for grad school. I go to my alumni gatherings and it's just fascinating uh, what happens now in, in that sort of environment. So I would put that on the list for our entrepreneurs as well. Yeah, I mean, Mary, thanks for bringing that up. I think it's a, it's a really important point. You know, with us, again, because, you know, two years ago, we were just looking at individual clinicians, but now that we have funds across the board at different levels that are making everything from pre-seed all the way through series, series B kind of investments, depending on who your investor is, that becomes relevant. But most venture funds, um, are addressing one set of, of or types of investments, whether you're an, you're, you're an A or you're a pre-seed or whether you're, you know, you're, you're doing more mature companies that are series B and beyond. Um, it makes it more difficult, but it's unusual for an investor to be able to step into an environment where they have opportunities to invest or syndicate across multiple different approaches within the same fund or network. And this is what we've been working on. And family home offices for, for me was that were not something that we were looking at. 
But what's become quite apparent now, and it's one of the reasons that I went on these trips that I mentioned earlier, is to meet with family home offices all over the world. And it's interesting their motivations and also their layers of hesitancy. Family home offices are very, very much interested in social impact kind of investing, but they also try to focus in on what they know. And healthcare is a scary place for a lot of investors. We all know that because they don't truly understand the moving, the nature of the, of, of, of the, uh, the vertical and how it's moving given everything that's going on. So one of the things that we've found on the network side is we've started to create an environment which is somewhat agnostic so that family home offices can come into our network, forget about the funds, and it's a place where they have access to leverage clinicians, advisors, consultants, and they have an opportunity to either invest in a fund or to invest alongside a fund or to invest directly in a company. So the companies that we're looking at, which we look at not just for the fund, but we look at to be part of our network from an, I'll call it an escalator perspective. Um, these companies now get exposed to these entities of family home offices and the family home offices are comfortable because they, they have multiple entry points. But to me, they're biggest concern has been, I don't have the resources to do the due diligence on this. And that's why the venture fund approach is important, but we're trying to kind of bridge that gap and give them resources that are not necessarily tied to a venture fund, but is the same process that they have access to. And, hmm. and you're right, it's a huge market. And the last thing that I'll add is, what was fascinating to me when I was in the Middle East was, the family home offices are not only interested in making capital investments, but they're very interested in exposing their regions to new technology, global technologies, but they're also interested in taking regional solutions that are entrepreneurial and exposing them to the rest of the global market. So they have a bit of a different motivational approach than the average angel or, or high net worth investor. Mm -hmm. well, that's fantastic. So we have reached the top of the hour and we're going to segue to question and answer. But before we do, I want to allow each of the panelists to maybe share any, you know, a thought that they have or, or maybe some guidance for the audience, 30 seconds or so as we head into 2023, as well as if you've got, uh, you know, if, if there's a preferred means of contact, if you'd like to be contacted by any of the audience members sharing what that information is. Um, Gary, we'll start with you. Sure. Um, I actually put my email up. I followed you, Jason. Um, so it's up on my uh, my my tile. Um, I don't know. Again, I, I think I, you know, I, I spent a lot of time talking about data these days. And I, I would say from an investor perspective, if you're in the audience and you're an investor, what you should be focusing in on is companies that are are working towards allowing clinicians and patients to leverage the data that we're collecting in a much more passive way with remote patient monitoring now and how it will be deployed at the point of care. So that's where I would put my dollar focus in, um, in, in terms of looking for higher multiple returns down the line. Um, yeah, I mean, that's really all. Um, I, I think if you, if you focus on that, you're really going to narrow down what's out there in a way that's probably a, a bit of a safer investment in the long term. Got it. And Mary Jo? Yes, I think um, going through this a bit of a challenging year, it's probably helpful to have, if you don't have advisors as part of your team, people in the industry, people with expertise, I think it's a good time to assemble advisors if you aren't active with them for a variety of reasons. None the least, it always amazes me. Skydeck does the best job I've ever seen engaging advisors. They have, I don't know, 500 of them, but the folks in their program, they are on the phone all day long accessing this expertise and contacts. I'm amazed how little of that goes on. So I guess I would encourage when you are in a bit of a more challenging time, make sure you access all the resources that are available that I'm amazed that 
the hours that people give to mentoring, advising, coaching, whatever you is awesome, at least in the Bay Area. So access it, use it, um, because it's available. Thank you. Thank you. And Mary? Well, I've just been noodling on some of the big themes where in, in thinking about the future of healthcare and some of the big areas that we're trying to go deep on proactively this year, which maps to a lot of the deal flow we're seeing. So just to share a couple of a few of those themes, more, more than a couple, but briefly, uh, a lot of movement and interest in women's health. Another bucket is AI, data, infrastructure, all the software and tools that really power the internal workings of the, uh, the, the industry and the ecosystem. Three is behavioral health, all flavors of behavioral health. Four is elder care, aging, aging in place. Five is social determinants of health and the broader network and support system that you know, lead to better patient outcomes and well-being. Uh, six is specialty care. And we're looking at a lot of interesting things that are in, whether it's gastrointestinal, you know, GI and gut health, musculoskeletal, very large spend in these specialty care areas. Uh, seven, I'm like, what number am I on? The, the sort of rural urban divide, just democratizing access. Telehealth, of course, is, is a large piece of that, but there are many other ways to think about that. Rural, urban, opening up access, patient engagement, and ultimately, you know, patient outcomes at the top of that, that list. And so it's an exciting year. There is so much going on. Really mm -hmm. encourage all of you to, to just keep building. We're here as a resource too. I'll put my info in the chat and just want to flag that Every member of our team at Bread and Butter does open office hours every week. You can book them on our website, which I'll put in the link, but just a quick 20 minute chat. You can pitch us a company, walk through a financial model, ask for any advice, just get to know us. Um, we'd love to hear from you and yeah, really appreciate this, this great discussion. Well, thank you very much, panel. It's not quite over. We're going to move to the Q&A function uh, or Q&A feature of today's uh, panel. So if you've got uh, if you've got a question, and especially if it's of general applicability, please use the Q&A function. Uh, we're going to be answering those. I also keep, uh, so I'm Jason Putnam Gordon, an emerging growth and venture capital attorney with KNL Gates. I work with emerging growth companies. I also keep office hours. So if you want to set up a time, feel free to email at jason.gordon at klgates.com. Uh, if you, you know, just want to connect with me on LinkedIn, cause I do a lot of events, feel free to do that. Jason Putnam Gordon on LinkedIn. That's why I use my middle name because there are a lot of other Jason Gordons out there. And then sort of separately, I've put together a, a resource called Venture Capital Training Camp. It's in sort of a limited beta run right now, uh, but I'll put that in the chat. And it's basically kind of gets, at least from the legal perspective of what you need to know, if you are in the US, you're going to be working on a startup from formation through seed and, you know, seed financings through your first preferred stock raise. Um, so if you want to check that out, feel free to do that and give me some feedback. We're going to be iterating on it and improving it this year. And I'm excited about that. So with that in mind, please uh, let's move on over to our question and answer session. I've got one question in. And I'm going to take it and sort of reframe it. So I think it'll be of general applicability. But as we've got three venture capitalists on the panel today, the question is, at the heart of the question is, when you are making a decision or you're going to take, you know, a company that you want to invest into your, um, you know, management partnership committee, meaning to get approval for the investment, you know, how, what's the analytical framework that you apply when making that investment, both in terms of like the upside as, as well as sort of risk. And some, some of the things that are kind of buried in this question here are, you know, management experience, valuation, legal terms, market opportunity. But I think it's helpful maybe if we just kind of start with what is the framework that you apply when, when determining to, to make an investment? I'll pause there. Gary, you're on mute. Okay. You, do you want us to just chime in? Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean. Please, okay. there, yeah, absolutely. We, we have an interesting model because again, we're a balance between our fund and our network. So ours is a very inclusive process with our LPs. Um, although, you know, I mean, the LPs are limited partners, but we, since we do such a heavy amount of clinical due diligence, the way we do our due diligence process is, we have our network, which is our own proprietary platform. It's like taking LinkedIn, Slack, Dropbox, and Zoom and putting it all into a single place that's focused in on digital health. So when a company comes to us, what we do is we create a community in our network, okay? And it's a secure community. 
open to, we invite in the general partners, any appropriate targeted advisors from within our network that are interested in participating or that will make the match to, and then the leadership team of the company. We create a file, uh, a data room, which is completely secure. Um, and we invite everyone in to both synchronously and asynchronously participate in the due diligence process. Now we have a very rigorous clinical approach, but we also have our the typical venture capital approach of those checklists of things that have to happen for us to be able to make a decision. And we record all of this collabor collaborative effort in that community and then make a decision as a group. And then the GPs ultimately have the final decision. Once we make an investment, that community in our network then becomes a portfolio company community in our network exposed to our global network. So we then go into the, you know, to, to the portfolio management perspective, and we are anything but a passive investor in which we make, we give access to our entire network for everything from getting from idea generation through commercialization. So for us, it's a very rigorous process. And we use that not just for the funds, even if a company just wants to be in our network, they have to go through that process to get the good housekeeping seal of approval. And, um, and we will, you know, look, I mean, I, I know Mary, both Mary's well, we have a lot of other VC partners, angel groups, so we're, we are very agnostic on the network side, and our goal is to help the company no matter how to get the capital that they need once we have made the decision to help them. Um, so we're always actively syndicating and internally working with the companies to get them to the next milestone, whether we're an investment or not, once they've gone through our due diligence process. I can speak a bit to just our sort of lens on evaluation. So ultimately the major factors that we look at are team market product market timing and team fit in both directions. So briefly on that, you know, founding team is the really the paramount driver of the decision here. And we prefer to invest in multi-founder teams who bring a variety of skill sets and perspectives and complement each other. It's not to say that we wouldn't invest and haven't invested in solo founders, but we really weight heavily in our decision that the team aspect of that. Uh, market, of course, how large is the market? Are you reorganizing the market? Are you expanding the market? How do you think about the market? Product and tech, ultimately, we are tech investors. Every investment we make uh, is, is we have to be really excited about the, tech, the current tech or the potential for that tech. Market timing, I don't think we talk about nearly often enough, but what are the headwinds, tailwinds, any macro factors here that really the same business, if you look at the back in the social media boom, right? What did, what did Facebook have in that moment that MySpace maybe it was five years too early or just that that moment in the market means a lot. And then the last thing that's really important to us is, is their team and culture fit in both directions? Meaning, are we uniquely as bread and butter positioned to provide value and outsides way beyond our capital? And sometimes the answer is no, because we're just not deep experts in that specific subfield and we're not gonna be adding value on the biz dev side or we'll pass on great investment opportunities because we can't be that A plus partner and vice versa if we're not aligned in some way. So that's one thing I'd say. The other is from a seed stage perspective, our most important metrics are utilization and engagement, not revenue yet. I'd say about half of the companies we invest in are generating modest revenue at the time of investment, which means that half are pre-revenue. And it's really all about, are you building something sticky that users love and ultimately customers will pay for? And so we, we think a lot about that when we make a decision. And then, yes, we look at, you know, valuation and what is it? A, we invest across safes, convertible debt notes, price rounds. We can price and lead rounds. But ultimately, if it's a great fit and we love the company, I'm always confident we can figure out the right format or um, way to ensure that company is set up for success. And by that, I mean, if you've raised three or four safes, maybe we, we should definitely do a small price round at a minimum to sort of have a clean cap table. And so just figuring partnering together to set you up for success. Well, both of those are as good of best practices as you're gonna find. So I'll, I'll, I would add a couple of thoughts to the a lot of folks on the call that are entrepreneurs. First of all, 90% of decks that I get, and I look at all of them, if they're beyond eight pages, I may or may not look at them because I don't think they're customer focused yet. 
Uh, but again, th there's a screening process that you have to go through because I don't really wanna spend time with people until I believe it's a good use of their time as well as my time. Because you know, the entrepreneur's time is in some ways more valuable than mine. So that's why I'm sure you're wondering why this hoop of send me a deck and every, it's like everybody thinks of it like a resume. It's actually much more than that. I really do scrutinize them, look at them and get a sense of. Then I spend, I'll say more than 50% of my time in person or on Zoom with the top two or three people. Why? Because at the end of the day, if I look back on the exits I've gotten, which I guess is one way of saying there was some success there, most of it was because these were the most persevering, determined, passionate people I've ever known. And they went through high highs, low lows, change product, even change markets some of the time. What you see in that deck will look nothing like that 10 years from now. But the people themselves, if they've got that inner wherewithal, I put a lot of money on that, number one. And then the number two is I want to know how much time you spent with a real customer. I can't tell you the number of people that we were, you know, meet initially and they'll say, well, we've been working on this for two years. And I said, oh, good. So let me talk to your customer designers. And they go, what's that? They don't even know what it is. <laughs> it's like they've been in a cocoon. You got to be close to customers now. The, 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 the need for the, the product offering, service, or whatever it is you're, you've got, it's got to be an absolute critical element. It cannot be a nice have. It, it just can't. So if they don't know why the pain is so bad that they would pay lots more money than you're even going to charge for this, again, I say, come back in six months, keep going. But to me, those are the two most critical things. When you, after you do all the best practices that have already been described, that's where I spend the personal time. Thank you. Thank you all. Um, so there's a question that, that is, I think, fairly focused. You know, it's asking basically about how, how to be able to generate more clinical studies and, and trials for for early stage companies, but maybe what I want to do is like pivot that and, and sort of zoom it out a little bit. Mary, Mary, you mentioned earlier, you know, a good number of your investments are pre-revenue. I imagine maybe some of that's sort of generated by the fact that, you know, there's, they have to go through regulatory approval before they can go out and get, you know, actually bring the product or the service to market. Maybe that's not, you, you can answer that, but um, I would like to hear from the panel sort of you know, how, what lens do you take with respect to the, you know, regulatory framework that a startup is going to have to subject itself to, right? And, and kind of what would you expect to see, you know, as they come in and pitch, like what level of awareness and what level of sort of plan? Because um, that's, that's one of the uses of the money a lot of the times, right, is to, to be able to get approval. So I'll pause there. And um, it looks like Gary's got his hand up. So I'll let him go. I mean, you know, we spend a lot of time with this clearly because of the clinical nature of, of, of what we do. Um, I think, you know, it's it's an interesting place because I think depending on where you're entering into the into the investment, right? So if you're talking about an early stage investment, a lot of times um, what we'll find is that they don't have a good understanding or haven't partnered with the appropriate strategic legal and strategic partners to understand what the regulatory hurdles that they have to go through are, okay? And, and that to me is a very big red flag, of course, um, but it's not something that stops us from making an investment, right? So if you're very early on and they don't have an understanding, that's the understanding of, of that because that determines the timeline to the next milestone right? That's number one. But if you already have that in place, I, I'm just going to step in and say what I said earlier, is that that regulatory hurdle, again, is a domestic and EU hurdle. It's not a hurdle in other places, okay? So again, from a clinical perspective, if we're looking at a company that we believe, let's say the solution is, it, it's a platform solution that has to deal with a clinical subspecialty, but the regulatory hurdle that they have to get through doesn't really, from our perspective, affect the ability of that platform to perform what it needs to perform at this point in time. 
those are the companies that we will say, well, while we're, uh, we're spending time and effort and capital to get through those regulatory hurdles, let's also take this to East Africa or take this to India and work with some of our strategic partners who are willing to deploy this in a clinical study kind of environment. But this way, when we are ready to commercialize once we have approval, we already have proof that this works in a, in a, in a, in a X marked size system where it's already been deployed. So that's one point. But if you're going through the regulatory perspective and just focusing in on that, I think it's, it's, it's essential to have those strategic uh, partners to be able to deliver to the table. And that's again from our network. So an example would be, we have a, a company Somnoware, which is in the sleep medicine space. And they're probably one of the top five solutions, but they've got a contract with Kaiser and with the VA and with the Department of Defense and John Hopkins. We have leveraged that relationship and said, okay, you're already using this platform. And here's a company that we have that's going through its clinical trials, which is again, very synergistic with, with, with Somna, where we would suggest that your clinical experts look at this as a possible clinical trial for your system. And it could be a Mayo Clinic or a Cleveland Clinic or whatever it is. <laughs> so that's one of the things that our network does with those investments. So it's really important and they tend to need that help most of the time. I managed to have myself on mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> Mary Jo or, or Mary, anything to add? Uh, if not, I, uh, I think also maybe weighing in on identifying who the payer is going to be and sort of navigating that is, is something to be good feedback for the audience. That's a big one. We, In fact, it's ironic that we've gone all this time without talking once about a payer, <laughs> when in fact, that's the, probably the greatest challenge for a lot of these folks is not only do they have to do all the things that you do everywhere else, but often they have to get CPT codes so they can actually get paid for this uh, and understand the, that whole dynamic and engage them. And again, those folks are very busy and everybody wants to, to get in and and get a, a, a pay code. Uh, it's going to be interesting. 10 years ago, that everybody talked about value-based payment and that we would be, within a few years, we'd have it all the way through the system. Well, as everyone knows, it's hardly inched along at all. Uh, it, it's getting there. Medicare, Medicaid can do a lot there. But the, the dilemma with actually getting pay codes, if you're not a B to C, <laughs> Everything else after that, you really got to engage with understanding the whole payment system. So you've got the regulatory system, but you also have the payment system to think about. And there again, it really does help to have people partnered with you that know that, know how to talk to the people, how to access them, uh, and, and so on. And again, the earlier, the better, even if all you're doing is passing the concept by them. If we can do these four things, and show we save this, the, the, would you be open to working with it? Even knowing that ahead of time, they may say, well, we've already got four others, so no. <laughs> uh, some of that's very, very helpful. So thank you for raising it. My pleasure, Mary. Did, did you have something to add? No, I think it was very well covered. Okay, wonderful. Um, I'll say I'll say one thing with respect to that. So, um, and I think it's important because we tend to focus when we hear the term payer. Okay, everyone thinks insurance, and 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 again, that's I I, I think it's really important to look at healthcare and where we are now and where we believe it will go. Okay, um, and is again the ground is shifting like an earthquake here. Um, clearly the payers are in control right now. And I will say one, you know, per what, what Mary Potter was saying is that my experience has been that that's an area that most early stage startups <laughs> haven't paid anywhere close to enough attention to the idea of what it takes to have a CPT code developed for something that's a new way of collecting data or a new piece of data that isn't 
being paid for right now. That's a very long cycle that costs a lot of money and it get, tends to be underestimated. But on the other side of the coin, I want us to really focus in on that the market is moving, okay? And my prediction, and I'll, maybe I'll be wrong, 10 years from now, it will not be the payers, it will be the employers, okay? The employers are the ones that have the right motivations to for the, their employees and for their systems to drive down the cost but maintain the quality of healthcare. Whereas I'm not convinced that the insurers are there and they certainly have different motivations. So that's one step. But so we're invested in a company, UberDoc, okay? And UberDoc's approach is to say, well, maybe there's a way to deliver care to a certain segment of the population, which is going down that direction that Amazon seems to be looking at, the one medical side of things, where how can patients have access to care in a way where in many circumstances, it may be less expensive for them to pay out of pocket than it is to use insurance and pay the, the deductible. An example, Paul Amuto, who's the CEO for, for UberDoc, has gone out and partnered with national radiology chains and partnered with women's health breast surgeons and OBGYNs and bundled it in a way where it's actually less expensive to get a mammogram with their system than it is to use your insurance. And it's much more comprehensive. So the future of care is, is changing. And I think that we shouldn't be so focused. I mean, we obviously have to be focused on CPT codes and who pays for it but with the understanding that as venture capitalists, we need to have, again, a predictive approach of looking at the future of healthcare and where it's going, because we don't want to put all our money in the insurer's basket when the ground is shifting. So I, I, I would just encourage everyone at every level to really start to think that way from a clinical perspective. Well, terrific. Um, so we've got about five minutes uh, left and there's, uh, there are a number of really focused questions I don't think um, are particularly applicable, but if folks want to email me and set up a time to chat about some of, some of this, I'd be happy to share with them my own thoughts. So with that in mind, I want to be very respectful of the panelists' time. I want to thank Mary Jo Potter, who's a partner at Pegasus Tech Ventures, for joining today, Gary Goldman, who's Managing Director at Global Health Impact Fund, Mary Grove, who's a managing partner at Bread and Butter Ventures. Thank you all so much for your time. To those audience members, thank you very much for attending today or on an asynchronous basis. Um, I want to thank Idea to IPO for organizing today's event and for my firm for supporting it. And with that in mind, I'll let you all get back to building your great companies. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank Thanks you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us. Thanks so much, everyone. Bye-bye.